Modern Pleasure answers the questions about sex that you've always wanted to ask but didn't. Join me, Kim K, and our resident sex expert, Dr. Jenny Schuyler, as we dive deep into combos ranging from sexual intimacy and pleasure to eye-opening sexual revelations. Welcome to Modern Pleasure. I'm Kim K, and our podcast is sponsored by Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve, if you've not heard about Adam and Eve, then you should definitely check them out because they've got all the good stuff, all the toys that you could ever want in the bedroom. Go to adamandeve.com and you can get 50% off right now plus free shipping. And all you have to do is use code MODERN at checkout. It's that easy. MODERN, M-O-D-E-R-N at checkout and you'll get 50% off. But that's not all. You're also going to get three bonus sexy items. Wonder what that means. Sexy items could be anything, right? And six movies, some fun movies to enjoy with your significant other. And don't forget that free shipping. So no matter what you choose, it's all going to be packaged and set very discreetly for free. And uh, you'll have some fun in the bedroom. Let's see what happens when you go to adamandeve.com, select any item, use the code MODERN, M-O-D-E-R-N. And this is an exclusive offer specific to listeners of Modern Pleasure. So be sure to support us and use the code MODERN to get 50% off and 100% free shipping. Go to adamandeve.com right now. Like to welcome our sexpert, Dr. Jenny Schuyler. Is that what they call you, Jenny? They call you a sexpert? <laughs> or am I just calling you that? <laughs> I have many labels. Sometimes it's resident expert. Sometimes it's sexpert. If you're combining this, sometimes it's just a resident sex therapist, resident sexologist. Uh, I answer to all of it. <laughs> Wow. So so these titles must play a couple of different roles, maybe, am I thinking? No, they all play the same role. I think it's just people's comfort with different vocabulary. Oh, okay. That's really interesting. So um, Modern Pleasure is something that we've been working on for quite a while. And it's, uh, it's a program that is going to get into that real discussion of all things sex. And when I mean all things, we're going to be getting down and diving into some good stuff. And I'm super excited about that. Um, Jenny, tell me a little bit about your expertise. What is it that makes you um, this expert in this this subject? And, and how many people have you been helping throughout the years? I know you have a book out, and I'm really curious about that too. <laughs> So we might get into that as well, but uh, fill us in a little bit on who you are and why you do what you do. Um, sure. I've been with Adam and Eve as the resident expert or sexpert for four years. I believe that's right. I think it's about four years, a little plus. And I've been a certified sex therapist for, oh, I don't even know how many years, probably a decade. I've been in private practice with the Intimacy Institute, which is my first baby, my first business, and that's been about 12 years. And basically, I'm a ASECT certified sex therapist, so that's the Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. And I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. So what I do in my private practice is I really combine clinical sex therapy with relationship therapy. I see individuals and couples. And actually, I work with my husband, so he does the same thing I do. Which oh, is no fun. kidding. So you guys both do the same thing? Yes, we do. Oh. He has a different clientele. Uh, he sees more men, more men with like out of control sexual behaviors or masculinity issues, certainly erection and ejaculation issues. I see a lot more women with um, painful intercourse, anorgasmia, desire discrepancy stuff. And then we both see a lot of couples. So we've been helping people, thousands of people. We have a couple's retreat. We've put our couple's retreat onto a video course. Um, We're just really engaged in that world, both educationally and therapeutically. So it's safe to say that you have heard it all. (laughs) Yes. We used to do training for, for sex therapy too. So we would train sex therapists when they were newbies in the field to really get acclimated and comfortable on a personal level first 
with the diversity of sexuality out there and possible. So if somebody walks into your office with something unique or unconventional, you don't have your jaw hit the ground. You go, oh, okay, that's unique. You get trained in this. Yes. So nothing is too surprising. Well, nothing is surprising to me at any point any, anymore. I've I've seen and heard it all. So, you know, that that's fine. And I kind of love the diversity and the unconventional stuff. But a lot of therapists, you know, they get to their edges sometimes with some of those more edgy pieces. So it's really just knowing your own edges so that you attract the population that you know to serve best. So what what drove you to this profession? I mean, who, who wakes up one day and says, I'm going to be a sex therapist? <laughs> um, well, that's a good question. I think there's sort of a blended answer. My my childhood was, I was I'm a, I'm a child of a divorced couple, and my dad really raised me, and he's a medical doctor, and so he really wanted me to understand the world very clinically and medically. So he had all the sex education books at home. We had all the books for every subject at home to include sex. So I just thought it was another run of the mill subject, and you know, it's just another topic on the table, kind of literally except that it wasn't a topic on the table for other people. So they would gravitate to my house to read my books and ask me questions. And I sort of became the Dr. Ruth of my friends in high school. Oh, my gosh. There's a label. (laughs) Um, You know, but then the other side of the story is, you know, my parents were divorced because my mom struggled with drugs. She struggled with drugs because she had a really tricky childhood with um, really with child sexual abuse which really destroyed her sexuality. And that part of my profession, I'm really inspired and, you know, desired to help people reclaim their sexuality, to reclaim their pleasure and their, and and give themselves that permission for pleasure, especially in the face of overcoming abuse and surviving from that. So she's also my inspiration as well. So I have this like duality of like, just a lot of information and becoming familiar with it and becoming that that familiar place that people would come to and knowing that this was not something my mother ever was able to enjoy i want to be able to help people enjoy this wow that's that's amazing so uh, my role in this is that i really have a lot of questions um mm-hmm. I, let's let's just dissect me for a second here and i really don't want to get too far into it because we could go on for hours but I, you know, have never been a highly sexual person. And I think it goes back to my childhood where I never suffered any kind of abuse or anything like that. But I did catch my parents in the act one time and it didn't turn out well for me. Oh, so, you know, I mean, it was just one of those things where you you hear these noises. I was probably like seven or something. And I'm like, wow, what's going on in there? And kind of, you know, peeked in the door. And my dad wasn't happy about that at all because I screamed. I thought he was, you know, hurting her. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, what is going on in here? And I think it really embarrassed my dad. And I got in trouble. You know, it's like you need to go to your room. You need to not, you need to learn how to knock on doors. And, and it was, and I was punished and I never got that explanation of what was really going on. And I think it sort of repressed that feeling of, uh, you know, feeling free about sex and, and it being okay. Instead, I think I grew up going, oh, this isn't okay. (laughs) You know, there's something very wrong with here that you're not supposed to know about. And I think that is a, is a, of course, when I was younger, you know, in my twenties, who isn't, you know, having fun and you don't think about it in those terms. I've been married now for 19 years. So sex is a much different thing for me. Mm -hmm. Um, My husband would like me to be that 20 year old, you know, person who was free and didn't care. But it's, I I think for me and my role in this program is that I feel like I have the same questions that a lot of other women and maybe even men do because I'm getting them from my husband about sex. There are so many variables, right? I mean, it is a broad freaking subject. Mm -hmm. And, And so why modern pot, why modern pleasure podcast? 
I think we decided that out of all of the different uh, programs that I've heard of with sex or listened to, I felt like there was a lot of clinical discussion and not enough raw answers, not enough real answers, real, real questions, real people, real problems, and a real discussion about it. And I want it to be uh, as as natural of a conversation as, you know, I would have sitting around with my girlfriends. And sometimes those conversations can be extremely hysterical. And sometimes they can be a bit troubling, you know, because it it I think you have to get a little vulnerable in these conversations. So that's what we're hoping for. And I think we're kicking off uh, this first episode pretty well because we've got a very um a very broad subject uh starting modern pleasure off right with the big bad narrative of good sex and so i think there is that you know question uh what is good sex how do you define good sex how do you know if you're having good sex <laughs> you know i mean i think i would know but good sex to me might not be the same as good sex for somebody else, right? That's so. exactly correct. And, and and that is why the narrative doesn't serve us because we can't all fit into it. Right. So where do we start here? Um, do you, do, should I just a a ask the question of what is, uh, what is, what do most people think good sex is? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, the, the title speaks for itself, right? The narrative, where we have a social narrative of what counts as good sex, or I would say, Kim, even what counts as sex, forget even good sex. And that narrative um, is very exclusionary, right? There's not, an inclu there, there's not a lot of people that can fit into that in terms of inclusivity, and there's not a lot of uh, activities that fit into this. So the narrative and you sort of see it in Hollywood and you see it in social media and you, you just sort of see it perpetuated sort of unconsciously and consciously. But the narrative is this man, woman. So genital a right a vagina with it, which is the canal of the vulva has penetration from penis. Wait, 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 wait. I'm going to stop you. Yeah. The vagina is the canal to the vulva. Right. So the vulva. <laughs> I love Eve Ensler. I was in her monologue in college. I got to write my own monologue on female pleasure. It was the best experience for me. <laughs> However, it is not the vagina monologue. It's, I think it should have been the vulva monologues. The vulva is the female genitals, the inner labia, the outer labia, the mons pubes, even the, oh, okay. the clitoris, the clitoral hood. Would you like a visual? Yeah, well, we've all heard about the clitoris. We all know about the clitoris, but nobody talks about the vulva. Oh, look at this. Is that a pillow? It's a pillow. Yes, it's a pillow. This is in your hometown. Well, you know, your state. This is in California. They have the wondrous vulva puppet. Maybe they can be a sponsor now, too. This is a puppet. Oh. This oh is a puppet. You can put your hand in it. But I love to do this anatomy because, yes, the vulva is the entire genital. So outer labia. Inner labia, clitoris, clitoral hood. The vagina is the canal, right? The, the, the vagina is is where babies come out. The vagina is where toys, fingers, penis, you know, any object can go in, right? There's a, there's a space where we can kind of dissect the G spot. There's a space down there for the A spot. There's a lot of like intricacies of the pelvic floor. But I say vulva because it's the entire genitals. Oh, okay. See? I didn't pay attention in sex education. Well, they didn't really have sex education when I was in school. So no wonder I didn't know about the vulva. So, okay, this is fascinating. So you've got this uh, this pillow, this pillow, vulva puppet, and, and you use that. I mean, okay, I've heard, I've, we've all done the mirror thing, right? All looking at our genitals in the mirror to kind of see. For us, it's a very difficult thing to do because it's very complex for guys. They see it all the time. So yeah. I never really thought about it in those terms, but that makes a lot of sense. And I think understanding all the pieces that go into that little uh, vulva puzzle would probably help in terms of pleasure, right? Oh, I teach my couples all the time the actual anatomy 
Sherry Winston calls us the anatomy of arousal, but it's the, if we know the anatomy of our parts, then we know how to touch them and how to lick them and how to kiss them and, and, and the good pace to engage them in. So this comes us full, brings us full circle to the narrative. The narrative is we have penis vagina intercourse, right? Yeah. And and it's penetration. And I'm going to use that word carefully because there's a different way to think about it too, besides penetrating into versus absorbing, absorbing your lover versus penetrating your lover. So there's different ways to think it. Some people want penetration. They want that carnal yum. And some people want that sort of slow absorption. Either works, right? My whole MO is have the diversity of options on the table so that you get to choose without having to judge any of the options. Um, but it's penis vagina intercourse. So it leaves out a lot of people who don't have that kind of well identity. And it just leaves out a lot of people who want to have other kinds of sex and oral sex, anal sex, manual stimulation, mutual masturbation, right? It doesn't include the diversity of activities that we can engage in. And so the other piece of the narrative is we must get to this point. Otherwise, sex has failed. And we must also both have an orgasm and in Hollywood at the same time. So the right. penis goes into vagina all in all of 90 seconds because foreplay doesn't really exist. And if it does, it's like 90 seconds to two minutes, which is really inadequate for most people. And yeah. then we have this intercourse. We're supposed to have this magical simultaneous orgasm. And then we feel successful. And if we don't fit into that narrative, right, if we have painful intercourse, if we have ejaculation issues and come too quickly, if we lose our erection, if we don't have an orgasm for whatever reason, then we feel like we failed. And then we failed the narrative. So the whole narrative is filled with this pressure. It's like a pressure valve. I must fit the narrative to feel like I'm a good lover versus F the narrative, right? Like the narrative only serves a small portion of our sexuality if we can even fit into it. And even if we can fit into it, sometimes it feels like a transaction because I'm just getting to that orgasm to check that box versus I'm going to just linger in the pleasure. And maybe the pleasure is a quickie and maybe the pleasure is an hour. But if we put the pleasure first versus the performance or the pressure first, it's a really type of diff different type of sex we're having. Yeah. And I definitely can uh, relate to that, um, especially going through menopause, being an older woman, having no libido. I mean, and I know we're going to get into a ton of discussions about this in other in other uh, episodes, but I, <laughs> I have a funny story. It's not really funny it, or maybe it is. Who knows? My husband is very sexual. You know, he's this Latin guy. Right. So he's got a lot of sexual uh, feelings, uh, about everything. And, um, and I'm, I'm not as sexual. So there's definitely a little bit of a, a skewed dynamic there between us when it comes to sex. And he's got this little Kama Sutra book. It's like this little pocket Kama Sutra book. I have no idea where he got it. He's had it forever, but he'll literally put it into a, he'll, he'll, open it up to a position and put it on my nightstand or my bed pillow. And I'll go into the bedroom and I'll see this position that there is no way in hell I'm ever going to get into. <laughs> you know, I mean, even if I wanted to, I don't think I could <laughs> anymore. But he, the, he has this vision in his head that this is what our sex needs to be. And, you know, he's got all this, he's got a whole different vision of what sex should be like than I do. Mm -hmm. And this definitely can cause some problems. And I know I'm not the only person that feels this way. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that there has to be a, a, a way to learn how to communicate what it is that we want without saying, well, you know, Kim's raising her hand here. I just want a quickie and I don't care if I have an orgasm. <laughs> you know, I want to make you happy and we'll be fine because when you have an orgasm, honey, you are so much more fun to deal with on a regular basis, right? And I'm good with it because the, lib the libido for me isn't there as much as it used to be, right? And I know that that's not okay. I know that that needs to change. And we definitely are working on that. Well, hold on. Says who? Now we're now you're playing into the narrative. Oh, wow. You're good. I am, aren't I? 
Well, there's two pieces to your narrative, just to challenge for a moment. One is that you're not sexual because you don't have as high a libido. You are certainly sexual. Your arousal may be more elusive because you're a woman or a woman in, you know, in, in, in midlife. And that makes sense that your arousal is more elusive, but that doesn't dilute your sexuality. And oh. that you have some requirement to have a higher libido or a higher sex drive that's not really a clinical term, but the, the the pressure to have a higher sex drive is is the narrative that we perpetuate versus what's wrong with having whatever sex drive you have. Well, that makes me feel better. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> so how, but I don't know if it'd make my husband feel better, you know? Well, well, but he has different needs than you do. So as a couple, it's not actually adhering to the social narrative for either person that works for the couple. It's co-creating your unique narrative as a couple. What works for both of you? I mean, this is my job. This is what I do yeah. with couples. Is that the, the biggest topic that comes in is this discrepancy between people's libidos. And so we have to co-create a new narrative that works for both people which is really actually dissecting what does sex mean to you and what are the needs underneath it. It's not just putting your penis somewhere and having an orgasm. That's actually kind of mundane and, and, and not that satisfying. So, so we want to actually dissect what is it about sex that is driving him and what is sexy about it and what do the Kama Sutra positions mean, right? <laughs> and we also want to dissect like what do you need, right? And, and it might be what do you not need, you know? Do you not need as much push and as much pressure and so it is actually the, the, the narrative of good sex is the co-creation for each couple uniquely. Adam and Eve is not giving you 10% off and not 20% off or even 40%. Your discount is even bigger. AdamandEve.com is giving you a whopping 50% off. But why stop there? Use offer code MODERN. And you'll also get 10 free gifts. Like a sexy item for him, a special toy for her, and something you'll both enjoy. Plus six free spicy movies and free shipping. So go to adamandeve.com now for 50% off and more. So let's go back to the term normal. Sure. So when when we're talking about normal sex or good sex or uh, defining what that is, is there a consensus of, of people that rate higher, you know, on a, on a percentage basis of this is what's normal based on this amount of people. I mean, I I'm sure it's different for everybody, but I think when you're comparing, and I don't even know if that's a good idea or not, probably not, but what if you're comparing what your sexual needs are or arousal needs are compared to everybody else? How do you, how do you stop I think that stops me because I feel like I'm not, you know, and I, and I know, I know I'm not alone here. Mm -hmm. I mean, comparison is the fastest way to dissatisfaction. <laughs> right. I'm so. going to, I'm going to leave this program going, <laughs> who the hell am I anyway? <laughs> we're normal, okay. I'm, 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 I'm kind of liking where we're going. I mean, you know, hey, if I'm going to find myself, let's do it. But but it is what you're saying is it's actually giving me permission to feel the way that I do. So, you know, if I'm not alone in this, anybody who's listening, you have permission to feel exactly the way you do <laughs> about sex, right? Mm -hmm. Some people identify as asexual. Right. They, that that is that is how they prefer to operate in the world, you know, absent of of interacting sexually with other people or or feeling sexual arousal and sexual desire. And there's a diff, there's a spectrum of asexual, too. And some people have a very high drive and a high curiosity and a high tolerance for adventure. I mean, both can coexist at the same time. Those two people in one marriage, it's a struggle. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, it works. I mean, it, it, we can make it work. Again, it's compromising. Um, it's finding the compromise for that unique narrative. But what is normal, Kim, is a beautiful question, right? There's a there's a book that Emily Nagowski, she's a sex researcher, wrote around. It's called Come As You Are. And the whole premise of her book, which is the whole premise of our sex therapy and sex research field and has been for years even before her book, 
is this. It is all normal. It is all beautiful and acceptable as long as there's consent. So, so in my book, it's like, you know, two people can do whatever they want. And does it look like the neighbors? No. One couple might be having, you know, really vivacious anal sex and the other couple is tying each other up and the other couple is having a missionary vanilla position. All three couples can be normal as long as all six people are having a consensual time. And by that, it's like, you know, partner A may be having a pleasure of like, nah, you know, I'm having a nice time. It's like a five. And the other person would be at a 10. But, there's, but that's okay. You don't have to have the same amount of pleasure at the same time for the same activity. That's totally fine, right? Sometimes yeah. I enjoy the cuddling after with my husband more than, you know, the actual um, intercourse piece, you know? Right. Which I think also leads us to that question between sexual and sensual, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, or intimacy for that matter. Um, I try to tell my husband all the time, he thinks being intimate is, you know, having sex. (laughs) Like, no, that's not it. I'm pretty sure that there's more to it, uh, you know. And listen, I don't want to sound like we are just a horrible, you know, sexual couple because we have fun. There's been moments, um, Mm -hmm. but on a regular basis, you know, uh, how much sex do we have uh, uh, in terms of how much, uh, you know, somebody else might have it. It might not be enough. My husband would like to have it twice a day. That's not going to happen. But so there are all these, I think a in terms of men, and and I don't know, you know, anything other than what I deal with with my husband and what I've done uh, dealt with in past relationships. But I think men put a higher price on sex than women do, right? It's very, it's such an important thing to them, and it does make them feel very masculine. It makes them feel wanted. There's there's a psychological part as far as I can tell, or what my experience has been in, where men definitely carry a psychological and i um, offer that might be the narrative that is perpetuated <laughs> there we go with that word narrative again <laughs> well, it, that's the narrative and that's a, it's a dangerous narrative men it's a catch all right we're just going to dump all men into having a high sex drive i've got plenty who don't i got we're going to dump all men into wanting lots of ejaculation a lot of men don't i got some that can't ejaculate with delayed ejaculation you know, we'll dump all men into, you know, having sex be the only place that they know how to be intimate. Now, are there parts of this narrative that are worth dissecting for their utility? Absolutely. And and does your husband participate in the narrative because that's the narrative and it's so seductive? Probably, but it doesn't mean that it's totally true. Yeah. And, and I don't think that it's true for him to pass on a narrative on me either. Like, you know, having sex once a week isn't normal, honey. We should be having it two or three times a week. Uh, you know, hence the Kama Sutra you know, <laughs> uh, uh, open on my pillow at, you know, sometimes at lunch when I come in. <laughs> yeah. But rather than him say it's not normal to have it once a week, because that could be normal for some couples. And once a day could be normal for some couples and once a month could be normal for some couples and once a year could be normal for some couples, right? It's, hey, honey, I would love, right? Here's my request. Here's my need. I would love to have sex twice, three times a week. And maybe you say, well, I I don't really have the bandwidth for intercourse, but let's get creative and talk about what that could look like. Yeah. So putting a different, putting it in a different context, it doesn't have to be, you know, because yeah, intercourse can be painful for women, especially going through, you know, menopause or midlife. Um, And, and I've, you know, I've actually had, I'm going to be real open and honest here. I've actually had stuff done where it, you know, plumps it up a little bit so that it doesn't hurt anymore. And that definitely helps, but it doesn't help the libido. Yeah. Well, that's because that has has to do with the biggest sex organ, which is our brain. (laughs) Yeah. What turns on the body and what turns on the brain? What turns on the body is our arousal. So we really want to tend to that. 
And if that's more elusive, which it is, it can be for women, we just do not have as much testosterone flowing through our body, right? So arousal for, for those with, of us with less testosterone, arousal can be more elusive. Ara testosterone is like that gas fireplace. It's like right here, I'm going to remind you that I could just pop on with an easy button. But if testosterone is low in the human being, and a lot of men have low testosterone, so that that's a factor too in terms of their whole physiology. If testosterone is low, arousal just takes longer to access. It doesn't mean it's bye-bye. It just is longer to access. So we need more touch, more kissing, more stimulation, more sensation. So, so it's not in the brain. brain. The brain is a big component too, right? So if we have a lot of messages and narratives that block us from our permission, right? If they come from religion, family of origin, whatever those like Emily call, Emily Nagaski calls it the breaks, right? I like that narrative. Like what are the, what are the breaks? What are the stops in our brain that go, yeah, this is, I'm not allowing this up. I don't, I, I'm not going to like allow myself to just linger in this pleasure. And they're not always conscious narratives. Um, but when we're aware of them and we bring them to consciousness, then we get to work with them differently, but they do get in the way. Right, our brain gets in the way of of our sexuality. It can get in the way. I think it gets in the way of a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, if you've just joined us, you're listening to Modern Pleasure. I'm Kim K with Dr. Jenny Schuyler. We've been uh, dissecting my uh, my issues in the bedroom, which I wasn't really prepared for. But um, I have to be honest, I'm feeling. Just having this brief conversation with you, I'm feeling much better about my position here Good. <laughs> when it comes to sex. You know, I mean, because I think that's a big part of it. You know, I feel guilty that I'm not being as, you know, quote unquote sexual as my husband would like me to be or, you know, having sex as much as he'd, he'd like it or even defining sex the way he defines it. And what I'm hearing from you is, that my definition of sex and his definition of sex does not have to be the same for it to work. Correct. And nor does your frequency, right? If he wants to ejaculate five times a week, how many of those ejaculations can be with his own self-pleasure practice? How many are through intercourse? And how many are maybe like, you know, you hang out in the shower, you soap up together, and then he finishes his with his hand. Or you well, at our at our age, we'd be afraid that we'd fall and slip in the shower, and yeah. that would be a devastating <laughs> outcome. <laughs> okay, that work, you know, wherever. Yeah. You know, we're at that point where we're going to have to start putting plastic on the bottom of the tub so that we don't, you know, put plastic fall out. Yeah. Good. These <laughs> around. A lot of people have to work with their changing bodies and abilities yes. and illness. I mean, that's a huge piece. My cancer patients. It's a whole new normal. Absolutely. So, so put that plastic down. Great. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> well, okay. So you've, you've been uh, a spokesperson or, or working with Adam and Eve for a long time when we're talking about uh, like I my okay. I'm going to talk about toys here for just a second because, and my poor husband, when he hears this, oh my gosh, what am I going to be in for? But you know, it's okay. It's okay. He knew that this was, he knew that this might happen, but I've always enjoyed the little, what they used to call the little bullets, you know, the little things that I could actually, you know, take with me. Actually, I, I enjoy masturbation. I love using toys and stuff like that. Sometimes I like it better than having sex with my husband. Don't ask me why, but it's easier, right? There's no um, pressure. Pardon me? There's no pressure. There's no pressure. That's it. Yeah. Huh. Well, that, that's the narrative, Kim. And that's why it's a bad narrative, right? The narrative is I must perform sex. Right. And then we play into the narrative. The narrative is we must look a certain way. We must do a certain activity. We must have this certain style of intercourse and look okay doing it. And then we must have this orgasm. I mean, that whole narrative, I get anxious saying it because there's so much pressure filled into it. That's, That's why I say, get rid of this narrative, make your own. Well, you know, and I, and I was really happy with my little toy. I liked it. It's, I, I probably need to get it replaced, but my husband buys me this thing that is like, I can't, I can't even use it. It's so strong. 
it's like, oh my gosh, what, what, what have you done? And so when we are, you know, getting ready to have sex or, you know, trying to get to that place, of course, there's the Kama Sutra book and this big 12 inch vibrator that is just way too powerful. And, and it just, it's like, no, (laughs) I can't do this. But I, I want to talk to you about your experience with Adam and Eve. Do you have any uh, uh, ideas about um, what might work in the bedroom uh, from this uh, Adam and Eve? Adam and Eve is not giving you 10% off and not 20% off or even 40%. Your discount is even bigger. AdamandEve.com is giving you a whopping 50% off. But why stop there? Use offer code MODERN. And you'll also get 10 free gifts, like a sexy item for him, a special toy for her, and something you'll both enjoy, plus six free spicy movies and free shipping. So go to adamandeve.com now for 50% off and more. Yeah. I mean, I love what I love about working with Adam and Eve. And by the way, if you're listening, you know, go buy a toy right now and you get 50% off using our modern code. So, you know. There's a little plug for them there. But the, the truth is really the reason I love them and the reason I said yes to, to collaborating with them is because they put pleasure first. And I'm a big fan of having toys in the bedroom and I'm a big fan of find, finding the right toy for you. Whether whatever genitals you have, whatever vanilla or kinky sex you have, whatever furniture you need for the ability of your body, they have it or they'll get it if, if you don't if they don't have it. And the idea is really let's support our bodies to find the utmost amount of pleasure. And if your body, if your clitoris is like, I like a bullet. And another woman's clitoris is like, I like that big, powerful Hitachi one. <laughs> like, like there's something for everyone there. And, I, don't know what you, what you call that? <laughs> I don't know what your husband has. I'm guessing it's a Hitachi one. It's a 12 inch fat, powerful, or does he? Do you have a dildo that that vibrates? No, it's, it's not a dildo. It's you just have a Hitachi one, probably. I mean, it looks like one of my microphones. Yeah, it's, that's a Hitachi one. So the Hitachi <laughs> one is like the first fabulous vibrator, the grandmother of masturbation. Bless her heart, she's passed away. It's Betty Dodson, and she would have women's workshops. She would give them all a, a, a Hitachi wand make them look at their vulvas, explore, look at them, see them, and then play with the Hitachi wand. So this is like the original vibrator. And this is what women have used. And she would actually give them a towel, like a little hand towel, if it was too much power. Oh. on the walls. So again, if it's too much power, I don't, I don't own one, Kim, it is too much power for sometimes if you're really sensitive. So a bullet can be great for your body. It's finding what's great for your body. Everybody's different. Yeah, I and uh, by the way, uh, use code modern, go to adamandeve.com and you get free shipping. Do they sell that big Hitachi one? (laughs) And they also have a little mini travel one and they have the bullets and they have little butterflies. They got it all. (laughs) So there's an, there's one that I saw that I hadn't seen before and it's like shaped in a rose and it has almost like a little tongue action, right? Mm -hmm, That's a newer one. Uh Yeah. That looks fun. It's sort of, the idea is to stimulate oral sex. Uh, they have another one called the, gosh, I think it's called the Satisfier, Breathless Satisfier. It sort of sucks, like a pulsing, sucking sensation on the clitoris. Also to simulate oral sex. So it depends on what kind of, again, everybody likes something different on their body in terms of sensation. So I think it's finding what's right for you. And so, I mean, the beauty of going shopping, especially with a discount, is you can buy a bunch of things and then, you know, trial and error, or have a box of toys to play with. <laughs> You're listening to Modern Pleasure, and I believe that we have somebody on the phone who oh. might have a question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Who's this? Quinlan. Hi, Quinlan. Hi. What What brings you to Modern Pleasure? And okay. and I have a question for you. What What is your definition of uh, normal sex? Out of curiosity. Um, what is normal? I forget. <laughs> Good I answer. What normal is. I don't even know what normal is anymore. Because I'm older. So, uh, you know, it's like normal is different than it was when I was in my 20s, you know? Mm-hmm. 
So, yeah, I don't know. It's a lot different now. So, a lot has happened. <laughs> <laughs> so, Things happen. That's yeah. a question. Here. Normal is where you are right now. Who you um, are and what you are and what you need. That's normal. That's great. Gosh. Well. We've been talking about the narrative of good sex and how uh, I think that is the biggest problem for us. If do you yeah. have a question for uh, Dr. Skyler, I know that you and I have talked. Uh, you had you had called in and we took some questions from you. And I think Quinlan's biggest concern is that she doesn't have a libido anymore. She doesn't have that desire no. anymore. No, no, and there, and with that with that comes a lot of guilt. You know, um, a lot of a lot of guilt because my husband thinks that it has everything to do with him, mm -hmm. and I and I try to tell him that it has nothing to do with you. You know, it, it's got nothing to do with his being attractive or or you know desirable in any way. It's just that I have I have no desire. Here, I have no libido, and it's got nothing to do with him. And it's hard for him to understand that. So there's a lot of guilt surrounding that. There's no spontaneous desire. But what happens, Quinlan, if he kisses your neck and slowly takes off your clothes and starts to kiss your whole body? What happens then? Well, that never happens. That for, for us. Well, that might be a problem. <laughs> oh, yeah. That, well, yeah, there, that's, that's, but you know what? That's not his fault. That's my fault because. I don't want that. It's weird. It's like I, I, and I don't know why. So I don't know why it's, it, I feel like I can't shut my brain off. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't shut, I have so much going on in my life that I feel like I can't shut my brain off and I can't accept that. And it feels weird to me. It feels odd to me, I guess. Well, isn't that interesting? Never... Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, no, it, it, it's interesting because we were just talking about how the brain is your biggest sex organ and that mm. uh, pretty much everything uh, happens or does not happen because of it. Right. Well, makes sense. That would make sense because there's been times where, you know, we'll be, we'll be in the middle and I'll, all I'm thinking about is what I got to do after, you know, it's like, okay. Uh, how much longer is this going to go? Because uh, after this, I got to take care of kids. I got to do put laundry in the dryer. I got to, you know, and it's hard to say in the in the moment. And it feels and it's horrible. And I try not to do that, but it it kind of just kind of just happens that way. And and I know, you know, in reality, I know like logically that that's not a good place to be. And I also, but here's the thing. I don't even have the desire to even pleasure myself. Like I have, I have some toys. Oh, Quinlan, that's just that's, sad. It is, right? It is. Uh, we don't want to shame her. It's <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry, Quinlan. I didn't mean to shame you. <laughs> well, you know, whatever. So be that way. I don't care. It's whatever. But, you know, it, it, it is. It's like I don't even have the desire to even do that. And I used to. I used to, but for all for reasons, I feel like I have all of these things that I have kind of stacked on top of, you know, like all these medical things that have happened to me that I've kind of stacked on top of that and on top of that. So now the sex life is basically I I give it up for him because it helps him out. <laughs> so I'm the sacrificial lamb. I'm like, okay. You got three minutes and you're on the clock and it starts now. Oh, yeah. You know, I know that's, that one. That's, yeah. Basically, that's our sex life, you know. Hmm. <sighs> I know. Don't cry. Don't cry. <laughs> or cry. That's fine. You can cry. Listen, uh, Quinn, here's my, here's my, there's a lot here to unpack and it's probably too much for this episode because I hear a lot of different facts. Okay. But my biggest curiosity, I'll say, is this. There is a part of you, maybe not all of you, but a part of you that that doesn't want to open to even the possibility of pleasure. Mm. 
with yourself, right? With the toy, with yourself, with your fingers, with a toy, with a bath and faucet, right? There isn't, you know, there isn't that possibility and there isn't the possibility with your husband. And the and the question to unpack with yourself and maybe just go for a few walks and think through it, talk to this part of yourself, right? Why? What is what is the fear of opening up to the possibility of pleasure? What will be there if I do that? Hmm. I don't know. I don't know what what I don't know. Good you, question. Yeah. yeah, it's not to answer right now. I don't, grow up. It's like, I, I, I don't know. Was pleasure okay growing up? Or was there a message that it was dangerous? Because oftentimes we repress and don't allow ourselves to open up to the possibility of pleasure because it's dangerous. It might be dangerous because we might be perceived as a slut or we might be dangerous because our parents told us we're going to get raped if we do. Or it might be dangerous because religion said it was dangerous or bad girls are only, you know, embodied in their pleasure. Right? There's so many different narratives that block us from allowing ourselves to open up to that possibility of pleasure. Right. Well, you know, what's crazy is in my, in my life, I'm actually a bit of a daredevil. I don't mind doing daredevil kind of stuff. But when it comes to these kinds of things, I didn't grow up into a, I didn't grow up in a very openly where we talk about sex or even when, when it came time to even talk about it, it was like, my parents gave me this this cartoony kind of illustrated book that was like, here you go. And I was raised Catholic, and so I went to Catholic school and, and that kind of thing. And it was like, you know. Sex is a sin, and it's dangerous. dangerous. Growing up where, you know, I all my sexual experiences as far as before I met my husband were for all the wrong reasons. And it was a lot of promiscuity from the standpoint of it wasn't, it was to find love and it was to fill a void where my dad wasn't. Wait, and it was, hold on. Why is that the wrong reason? Check yeah. Your Why the wrong reason. Oh, yeah. That's normal. I was, I, I was, I, there's a lot of like, Quinlan, hear me. Quinlan, hear me. Quinlan. Quinlan. Quinlan, hear me. What? All the, the activities, you're labeling them as promiscuous and for the wrong reasons. That is. Mm -hmm. That is what teenagers do in puberty. They explore their arousal mm -hmm. and they do it for the sake of right. they do it for the sake of validation. They do it for the sake of attention. They do it for a relationship. They do it because they're horny. Everything you're saying is normal. See, and it wasn't labeled that, you know? Well, maybe look you at, labeled it at, that way. Well, no, but think about Think about in school, and this was in my 20s, because I, I, I didn't lose my beginning until I was older, and it wasn't by choice. It was kind of, it should have, it was it was a very sad situation, what happened to me, but but I don't want to go into it. But but he, um, back in those days, though, back in the 80s, whatever, late 80s, it was like, if you were that way, and I wasn't in high school, and I never went out with someone, guys in high school, because they're a bunch of blabbermouths. But it, you were labeled a slut or you were labeled, you know, and that was the way it is. And still, you kind of feel, it's kind of feel that way now. I think it's, I right. wish now, looking back, I wish that I would have owned it. I wish I would have owned it all. So you but can, I, Quinlan, you still can, right? Here's, here's yeah. your answer. You just found it. I just asked you, what is blocking you from opening up to the possibility of pleasure? And I'm hearing your answer be, because then I'd be labeled promiscuous. I'm that slut yeah. who opens myself to pleasure, right? Good girls don't do that. Versus I'm an autonomous embodied woman. Pleasure is my birthright. I'm allowed to open to this possibility of pleasure. Maybe I'll have an orgasm. Maybe I won't. Don't worry about it. But I can open to the possibility of it. Right. That's really interesting. I like uh, that. What What did you just say? Now I lost my train of thought. Thank you, menopause. Um, you okay. said, you said, oh, I hate it when that happens. Okay, so I'll, 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 I'll do it again, right? What I'm hearing Quinlan, and it's so common, it's so normal. 
to participate in the narrative that often comes from religion and society that if I have desire, if I dress a certain way, if I if I have activities of, of sexual exploration, I am promiscuous, right? That's a pretty damning word. Or something wrong with me, I'm a slut. That's also a damning word versus I'm curious and explorative. And that's normal in puberty and it's normal in your 20s and it's normal in your 60s and 80s, right? And And, and that's that's who we are as humans. That what that's what makes us human is that we actually are pleasure seeking humans. And and so the, but there's a lot of messages that say that pleasure is dangerous. So now we're going to de- wow. describe pleasure as promiscuous. We're going to describe pleasure as slutty. So if you get, if you hear that narrative, you can say I don't need to participate in that narrative anymore. It's obsolete. It doesn't serve me. It doesn't serve my marriage. It doesn't serve my guilt. It doesn't serve the three minutes we try to have sex, right? It doesn't serve me. But you know what would serve me? Owning the fact that pleasure is your birthright, that I have the possibility of pleasure, that I can enjoy when my husband kisses my neck and takes off my clothes and kisses the whole of my body and see if my body responds and enjoys that sensation. And it won't be familiar at first. It'll be awkward and weird at first because it's not familiar. You're going to have to tell your body, yeah, that's okay. That also normal is that this is unfamiliar and we're going to have to develop some familiarity with this practice. And once we do, it's going to feel more familiar and more pleasurable. Yeah. I I think what you said was pleasure is my birthright. That's what stuck, struck a chord with me. And you're right. You know, we, there is, and there should not be any reason why we shouldn't feel like we deserve sexual pleasure, sensual pleasure, Men whatever do. it is. That's the problem. Men do. Men do. <laughs> That's a narrative too. <laughs> Not all men yeah. do. <laughs> I hear you. That, that's that's a, a thing. Quinlan, that, that's, a, that's a narrative. That's, a, that's fake news. <laughs> men, men think they can do, do whatever, you know, and most men that I, it's like, why, why was there always a double standard? You never heard, you narrative. know, guys go, you know, do whatever and girls will label, you know? So many narratives. And it's so interesting that I think when I'm looking back now at the first, you know, question, what is normal sex? Well, I, I think that it really is defective upon the narrative. Yeah. And yeah. that's what we're talking about today is that I, I think what we believe isn't necessarily true. Right. And uh, that's what we've been told. That's what we've been taught. That's what we've learned throughout our life. And I don't think it, what I've learned today is it's not necessarily a woman thing. It's a man thing, too. It's, it's not female. It's not mm-hmm. just female. It's a human thing. Thank you, mm-hmm. Dr. Exactly. Schuyler. It is. And what's normal and what's normal for you isn't going to be, well, and I say normal in a quotation mark, by the way, because what is normal, but what's normal for you isn't going to be normal for me because everyone's got their own thing. Whatever they enjoy doing is going to be your thing. And for like all different kinds of people, you know, and I think also part of my problem too is that and God, I, I love my husband dearly. We've been together for 31 years. So, you know, it's a long time. But I am married to a man that had has no experience, like had no experience coming in. So, whereas <laughs> I had experience, but not, I didn't have, I didn't have this great, you know, Skills love, to learn. like, you know, like this great thing where I had, you know, all kinds of teachers was like, Hey, let me teach you stuff. But those are you things know? that can be changed. I mean, right. Dr. Skyler. It's weird though. Like, how do you teach your man? Like I felt like, cause I want to go down on you and I'm like, so you don't know how to do it. Right. <laughs> Wait, Dr. Chenny, get your vulva. I wish you could see this, Quinlan, because this is what I think this is what everybody needs is a is a vulva pillow. <laughs> I, 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 I won't see the visual of the vulva pillow, but Quinlan, you know, your what you will like in oral sex in your 30s may change in your 60s. So even if he had all the right skill sets for 
you in your 30s, he might have to learn something new in your 60s. And my point in that is, even if he had zero lovers or 100, your unique body is going to want whatever it needs. And so, yes, you do have to be the teacher of that. You do need to tell him, slow down, you know, don't jump to the genitals. You know, I like the three S's, slow, soft, subtle, right? I like tend to the whole body before we go to the genitals. And then when we go to the genitals, I like to do the outer labia, the inner labia. Don't don't just jump to that clitoris yet. Tease it, right? And then when you get there, slow, soft, subtle. Maybe have a finger inside your vagina while he's licking. He can have a finger inside, lubed up, right? While he's licking lightly on your clitoris. Those are skills that he can learn. And, And yes, do we have to communicate what we need for our bodies? Sure, you have to be your body's advocate. Your neighbor isn't going to be the advocate for your body. You need to be. Right, right. And Quinlan, you know, I challenge you to maybe, you know, uh, start the neck kissing and see what happens. Yeah. I'm not a a neck person. I won't let him near it. I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm I'm weird. It's it's your brain. you've, you've, You've got a blockage there, I think. Or try the ear. You know, if you don't want the neck, try the ear. You know, you could try something else. Try right? the ear. Try the shoulder. Yeah, the ears work. The there ears you go. Work. See? Yeah, the work. There work. you go. Ears either. Near the neck or out. Start the ear. Don't go near the ear. Yeah, it's, I don't know. I just, um, <laughs> if it was going to be either or, the neck would be the choice, but I don't do, I don't know why. What about so, shoulder? How about shoulder? I'll give that a shot. <laughs> okay, good. Or the lips. What if he nibbles on your lips? Oh, a lip nibbler. I yeah. like that idea. The lip nib, nib lip. Oh, what, if, what if he looks into your eyes and caresses your cheek? Love it. <laughs> okay, I think we scored. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Notice as he looks into your eyes and he caresses your cheek, right? The subtlety of sensual intimacy, right? What happens mm-hmm. to your body? Do you let that pleasure in? Do you, does your body start to get a little more electric? Does it turn on a little bit? Does, right. it, does it become more alive? Notice that. Follow that lead. Yeah. Make more eye contact. Yeah. That's where you guys start. Great. Well, Quinlan, I'm glad that you called in. I hope that Thank this you. was a little enlightening for you. It was. It was. Good. Yes. I feel like I... um. I feel like I need um, therapy to get this brain unlocked. I really do appreciate what you're saying. And and I think the whole promiscuous thing that really resonated with me, you know, and I've, I get it. And I, and I, you're absolutely right about the whole thing. And uh, I appreciate that. That was interesting to get that out. Good. Out loud. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate the call and I hope that things work out and that you find some you. Uh, pleasurable satisfaction soon. And we may have to uh, revisit this, Gwendolyn. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, look- thanks. Okay. Thanks for calling. Thank you. That was interesting. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I have to uh, thank anybody who's listening today. I hope that you got out of it what I did, which was um, a very enlightening experience for me. I, I'm excited to go on this journey with you, uh, Dr. Schuyler, because I think uh, by the time we get to the 12th episode, um, things might be really, really going well for my husband and I. <laughs> <laughs> and we may even have to get him on the on the show at one point. We'll see if we can't drag him in here because that could be a really fun conversation. Next episode, we're going to be talking about obligatory sex, which kind of Quinlan sort of touched on that. Like she feels like she has to do that. And I totally get that, too. So that's yep. going to be a fun conversation. Um, looking forward to that. Um, getting out of. I think that the key piece is extracting ourselves from obligatory sex. That's a huge piece. So (laughs) so extracting ourselves from obligatory sex. Yeah. All right. Who wants to have obligatory sex? Well, I I don't think anybody does, but I think it happens a lot. (laughs) 
Yes. Yes. That's why we put it into the, the topic list. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Want to thank our sponsors, Adam and Eve. And remember, go to adamandeve.com. All you have to do is use code modern at checkout. It's that easy. Modern, M O D E R N at checkout, and you'll get 50% off. But that's not all. You're also going to get three bonus sexy items. And it doesn't matter what you choose, all packaged, uh, discreetly sent to you. Nobody will know. Uh, Jenny's already given you a couple of great ideas, but they have a ton of stuff on there. And if you say the word or use the word modern, M-O-D-E-R-N, you get 50% off plus a lot more. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jenny Schuyler for um, joining me today. And I'm excited to uh, move on with our next episode and see where this all takes us. 